Hi everyone, today I'm going to do a retrosynthesis of this pharmaceutical agent known as PKI-166. If you find the video useful, please do give it a like and share and subscribe to my channel. Okay then, the pharmaceutical agent with this structure is an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's very potent and selective. It's got a sub nanomolar IC50 value, and it's also orally bioavailable. Now, if we're going to use this in the body, it's super important that we make this as one enantiomer. So the focus of this video will be making one enantiomer of this product. Just at the start, I'll notice that the molecule has a phenol group, so an acidic proton. That could be pretty pesky if we carry that through many steps. So through the synthesis, what I'm going to do first is just protect it as a methyl group. That's pretty standard for protecting a phenol. And I'll take that off again at the end of the synthesis. As always, we'd start a retrosynthesis by identifying some key features. We have a para-substituted benzene. In the middle, we've got a bicyclic heterocycle with three nitrogens in it. The heterocycle is substituted with an amino group. And we've also got a stereocenter over here. Right, so from a retrosynthetic point of view, this will break into three natural chunks. And I'm going to choose to take my first disconnection where the amino group joins to the nitrogen heterocycle. This starts to make a bit of progress, and I think it's going to be the easier one to go for first. Joining two aromatic rings with a CC bond might take a bit more effort. We don't want to be relying on that at the end of a synthesis. Okay, so to break my CN bond, all I need to do is some sort of SNAR reaction, so nucleophilic aromatic substitution. That will take me back to this chiral amine, and we need a leaving group attached to the heterocycle. So an easy one would just be a chloride. I'm just going to abbreviate the other aromatic group for the time being. Now, the reason why this works quite well is that the way I like to look at heterocycles is that to all intents and purposes, there's something that looks a bit like an acid chloride there, where we could imagine a substitution reaction going like this to attack in, and an additional elimination could kick out the chloride leaving group. Just having a look at this chiral amine first, this one is actually very cheap and readily available, but I don't want to completely cheat here. This one is available as part of the chiral pool, but we might wonder why. It doesn't massively look like something that might have fallen out of a biological process. I'll just show you how it's been made so available so cheaply. This can be disconnected by resolution. Now a resolution means that we aim to make the racemic mixture of this phenol ethyl amine, so a 50-50 mixture of each enantiomer, and we try to separate them physically. So this racemic mixture is really easy to make. This is equivalent to a 50-50 mixture of these two enantiomers. The one that we want here has the R stereochemistry, and the one we don't has the S stereochemistry. And the way that we can physically separate these is to treat them with a carboxylic acid, which can form diastereomeric salts, one of which crystallizes really easily, and one of which doesn't. Now, there's a very easy way of doing this with L-malic acid, which is actually a dicarboxylic acid that looks a bit like this. If we mix up the amine in solution with this malic acid, which because it's come from nature is only readily available as one enantiomer, the amine will deprotonate one of the carboxylic acids and form the ammonium cation. Now it turns out when these two find each other, they precipitate and form a salt. So the R enantiomer of the amine stays dissolved in solution. All we have to do then is filter off the precipitate. And with our remaining solution, we then treat it with a base and we isolate the R enantiomer from our mixture. So as part of a retrosynthesis, we'd need to have the amine in the first place, but this amine is very easily obtained by reductive amination. That will take us back to acetophenone, which is very cheap, and ammonia, which is also, of course, available. Right then, just returning to our nitrogen heterocycle, our first disconnection should get rid of the reactive functional group, which is, of course, the chloride leaving group. A good ways of installing chlorides are just from the hydroxyl group, there are lots of ways of doing this. We just need to activate it as a leaving group and do some sort of substitution. Very common ways of doing this are to use POCl3, POCl3. In that type of process, oxygen forms a very strong bond to phosphorus. To give us something like this. And then the chloride can come in and kick out the leaving group that forms an even stronger phosphorus oxygen double bond in the process. So forming a strong phosphorus oxygen bond is a good driving force for this reaction. Now, one thing I really should note here is that the nitrogen heterocycle probably doesn't look exactly like this when it's in solution. These types of things are known to tautomerize to give us in preference the carbonyl-like structure. So this is a bit like a pyridone, but it's okay because either of these tautomers can react with the phosphorus as we want them to. I could just draw the other arrow, something like this. And we'll end up with the same chloride substitution. 
Right, so next I'm just going to clear away these mechanisms so I've got some more space. As I said before, when I analyze heterocycles, I try to map the patterns onto functional groups that I know from elsewhere. So just looking at the six moment ring containing the nitrogens, to me, this bit that I'm highlighting in yellow here looks a bit like a carboxylic acid if we switched out a nitrogen for the oxygen. And the bit I'm just highlighting in green here is an imine. And that's just like any old carbonyl. So when it's got a hydrogen bonded to it, that looks a bit like an aldehyde if I pretended the nitrogen was an oxygen. That sort of thinking tells me where some sensible disconnections might be. And it's drawing me to these particular two double bonds that are drawn in for doing some sort of carbonyl condensation reactions. So the unit I'm cutting out here is going to look something like this. And the pattern I'm aiming for is that that nitrogen will condense onto a carbonyl here, and the other carbonyl will condense onto a nitrogen here. These will form our two CN double bonds. Now, just the rest of that structure, now down here is the five membered ring. And on that remaining carbonyl group, well, I need an oxygen on here, clearly. I'd really rather not carry a carboxylic acid around if I can avoid it. I've got free choice here because I'm doing a retrosynthesis, so I'm just going to make it the methyl ester, which will be a lot easier to handle. I've just got formamide, which is cheap and readily available. And, you know, if I heated that with acid, I'd be reasonably happy that those CN double bonds would form and we can push towards aromaticity. So there's a strong driving force for this process. I should be able to hydrolyze off that O-methyl group just at the end using acid and water, using another SNAR type process. Okay, we've made some big progress now. We actually have quite a different structure to have a think about. The key functional group is a pyrrole in the middle, and we've got multiple substitution patterns. So there are lots of different ways of making pyrroles. Like for example, I could cut here and try to use some of the natural reactivity of the pyrrole perhaps to put on one of the substituents. But I think we can make a much more aggressive disconnection on this. I think we can make the structure from scratch. And what I'm looking at here is the fact that we've got two nitrogens coming off one carbon. And using my idea like before, if I for the moment pretended those nitrogens were oxygens, this pattern is making me think of acetals. So maybe I should be thinking about breaking a bond in there. And in fact, we can make the whole ring itself if we disconnect there. This plan might look a bit more obvious if we considered just an alternative resonance structure, something like this, where we can see that this is maybe a condensation again onto a carbonyl-like group. Okay, so doing the disconnection will give me something along the lines of this, where a forward step would be an intramolecular reaction, something along this lines. And then we're pretty much there. We just have to identify what sort of thing we've got here. Well, we've got an enamine, and enamines come from carbonyl groups. And I'll also note there's a fair bit of choice of what carbonyl group we want there. We could keep that amide in, but one big problem that we'd have is that the ester would actually be more electrophilic than the amide at the moment. So we've actually got a regio selectivity problem. So at this point, I'm going to switch out my amide and just put another ester in there. That removes the regio selectivity issues. So our disconnection takes us back to this tricarbonyl. So all of a sudden, we're not looking like a heterocycle at all. The other component we'd need is ammonia. I'll just note that there's two different types of carbonyls. There's the ester or the ketone. Now, the ketone is more electrophilic. So I'd be pretty happy that my ammonia as a nucleophile will be reacting with that ketone in, in preference. Although, to be honest, if it formed the amide first and then cyclized, it would still give you the same product at the end. Heterocyclic chemistry is a bit like that. There's probably a lot of different pathways happening at once, all heading towards the same aromatic product. So now I'm back to this sort of more linear structure. I can have a look for my functional group into relationships. And what I have is a 1, 2, 3, 4 dicarbonyl. So with a 1, 4 difunctionalized compound, we should be using umpalung chemistry. Now there's lots of options here, but I'm going to exploit the symmetry here and also acknowledge that carbon 2 is a branch point. I think the most sensible disconnection is between 2 and 3. That will take us back to dimethyl malonate which is cheap and readily available. And I need an umpalung reagent. Well, I'm going to use a reverse polarity system here. So perhaps on carbon three, I could just put a bromide and use this alpha halo carbonyl. Just to check that we're on the right lines here, I can turn a dimethyl malonate into a nucleophile by deprotonating between those two carbonyls. The pKa of this is around about 10, pretty low, pretty easy to deprotonate. And then we can just use that as a soft nucleophile. So it's well matched with that SN2 type process here. 
This SN2 is really easy on steric grounds because it's primary center. It's also really fast because it's got a stabilized transition state due to the alpha carbonyl. I think the SN2 is much more favorable than the aldol reaction with the carbonyl in this competition reaction. And just to finish off, we've made a reactive molecule, so we're going to need to take that bromide off. And that's pretty easy. There are loads of ways of doing monobrominations of methyl ketones. For example, some old school reagents for doing this would be acetic acid and BR2. That'll go via an enol form. And then we're just left with our power substitute of benzene. Quite an easy disconnection to do here, which is just a friedel crafts acylation to set up that substitution pattern. That will take us back to the acid chloride, which is available and anisole, which is also readily available. Now, once we've scoped out this retrosynthesis, we really should have a look at the forward synthesis to check we haven't missed anything, particularly any competing reactivity. Doing so will highlight an issue that hasn't come up naturally during this retrosynthesis. So I'll just get us a new slide to summarize the forward synthesis and work around that problem. Okay, now I'll just sketch out the forward synthesis. This might not be the best way of doing this in practice on a multi-ton scale, but I'm going to stick to some standard paper chemistry here. Okay, to start with, we're going to do a friedel crafts acylation. So that's just using something like ALCL3 to form my acylium ion. That will be paraselective for all the normal reasons when you have a pi electron donating group on a benzene ring. Next, I'm just going to use acetic acid and bromine. This is going via the enol. I'm generating a nucleophile in the alpha position to the carbonyl, which we can then use as a nucleophile to attack the BR2, which is the electrophile. Okay, the next component. So now I've got my alpha halo carbonyl. I'm going to send in my soft anion coming from the dimethyl malonate. So we just need a weak base here. So plenty of options there. That will set me up with my 1,4 dicarbonyl species. So in doing the forward synthesis, you can now identify that we actually have a slight problem here. If I'm going to treat this with NH3 to condense onto the ketone and form the enamine and then cyclize and aromatize, what I'll actually get is this. Now this is a pain because we want an NH2 here, which perhaps we might be able to do something here. We'd need to do some sort of substitution reaction and doing this onto an electron rich pyrrole ring isn't going to be so easy. Pyrrole itself is pretty nucleophilic. So nucleophile on nucleophile isn't so great. I know there's a carbonyl group coming off there, but that's probably not enough to change the reactivity that much. So actually I'm going to get stuck here, potentially having to do lots of steps. Now I can avoid this completely, if I just go back to my alpha halo carbonyl and decide to use a different reagent that's readily available. So I picked the malonate for symmetry before and to make sure that we got the right regio control. But there was another way around this. Amide versus ester is probably not the smartest move because the enamine will still probably condense onto the ester in preference to the amide. But I could pick a different functional group of the same oxidation level if I pick a nitrile. And now we can see how this helps us. Now the key reactivity difference we've got is that if we remember what our plan is, we want to add some ammonia and to help the condensations, we probably want to use some catalytic acid as well in there. Now the catalytic acid will help us change some of the reactivity because of course that nitrile has a basic lone pair which can react with the H plus that will promote attack into that position. So just moving over to the left to have a think about the mechanism. One thing that we could do, just gonna put an R group there, is protonate the nitrile first, ammonia comes in, to give us this type of structure, which then can condense on the ketone and tautomerize into aromaticity to give us the pyrrole. Or we can do something similar to what we had before in that we form the enamine first. Then in the slightly acidic solution, we prefer to attack the nitrile. So we avoid attacking the ester at that point. And again, that will just go on to the pyrrole after some tautomerizations. So actually either of those mechanisms are sensible. Probably both mechanisms are happening anyway at this sort of point. I'd imagine we're heating this reaction as well. So lots of activation energy barriers are probably achievable for lots of different pathways. Okay, so after all of that, we've ended up with the pyrrole ring system in the middle, the amine and the ester. The next step in the plan was to use formamide to clip in and form the six-membered ring. I think we're going to need to use some acid and heat here as well to help those condensations. So next, we'll just need to do a variety of substitution reactions. Firstly, I need that methoxy to turn to the, the hydroxyl group or the pyridone type structure. Aqueous acid and heat should be able to do that by SNAR. Two, POCl3 phosphoryl chloride. That will turn my hydroxyl group into the chloride. And once I've got the chloride on, I need to use my amine from the chiral pool 
which is available as a single enantiomer. And then we're really close to the active pharmaceutical ingredient. All we've got left is to take that methyl group off. Now the rest of the molecule is pretty sturdy. So we could use some standard conditions, for example, BBR3 as a Lewis acid to remove the phenolic methyl group and leave us with the three phenol and also our intended product. If you enjoyed this discussion, there's some more retrosynthesis videos of mine just on the screen now. Please do consider giving the video a like and share and subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it and it helps me plan out what other topics people want to hear about.